Hi, my name is Erica Crilly, and I'm a nurse practitioner in the hematology program at BC Children's Hospital. And my project for the research-based challenge is on changing paradigms, belief in NSAID use in patients with bleeding disorders. Historically, individuals with inherited bleeding disorders, such as hemophilia and von Willebrand's disease, have been counseled that non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, such as Advil, are contraindicated due to increased bleeding risk. This perception, I believe, may be outdated due to a large majority of our pediatric patients now on regular treatments that have drastically reduced their bleeding risk. And I think that the effect of NSAIDs in mild patients has possibly been overestimated and based on uh, biased studies of more severe patients in the past. Additionally, in pediatrics, NSAIDs have high utility for occasional use, both as antipyretics, anti-inflammatories, or analgesics in many situations. And I think the strict avoidance may lead to suboptimal management in some clinical situations. Unfortunately, though, that this paradigm has been challenged by few and then re reinforced um, by historical knowledge by many other healthcare professionals and medical resources, and it's been easier to continue to pass this down rather than focus on changing this paradigm. So the objectives of my product, project are to highlight the current perceptions on uh, NSAID use in children with bleeding disorders and gain a better understanding where it might be useful. This will be achieved through current literature review and uh, also through a survey, um, understanding a little bit more about perceptions of families' thoughts around NSAID use and situations where their children may or may not have received this kind of medication. Uh, I have conducted a brief literature review, but we'll do a more in-depth one. And next, I will gather some information through survey um, out to families electronically. Preliminarily, my results from my literature review have shown the benefits of ibuprofen in pediatrics are less frequent dosing. It's equally effective as analgesic and more effective than antipyretic, um, safer in overdose, and a superior analgesic in acute musculoskeletal injuries in pediatrics. Uh, additionally, the fear of increased bleeding and NSAID use in bleeding disorder patients is probably not supported by the literature. My next steps are going to be to do a short electronic survey. I'm going to construct it and send it out to families. The questions will be collected to understand the perception of risk, circumstances when ibuprofen was avoided, and Tylenol was given. If ibuprofen was given, what was the outcome? And past history alternative prescriptions such as Celebrex and reasons for this prescription. I lastly may also try to collect whether the patient has a CST label of an ibuprofen allergy or a note around avoidance. Thank you very much for um, being interested in my poster and I look forward to networking with many of you today. Thanks. Hi, I'm Meredith Cushing, a registered dietitian working in nephrology with a focus on chronic kidney disease and dialysis. Ensuring optimal nutrition status is the cornerstone in the management of children with CKD. A kidney-friendly diet can be overwhelming and may include many modifications, including sodium, phosphorus, potassium, protein, and fluid, which can make it difficult to navigate. Processed and packaged foods contain many food additives, including sodium, potassium, and phosphorus. Therefore, the recommendation is for families to prepare food at home using fresh ingredients whenever possible. In clinic, I have observed that there are many barriers to cooking meals at home, and many people may not have the necessary food skills to prepare a nutritious, kidney-friendly meal. To address this issue, we wanted to provide a series of online cooking classes, creating meals that were kid-friendly, kidney-friendly, and budget-friendly. We decided to create a study to assess food skills and to determine if online cooking classes would be an effective way to increase food skills, which would in turn make the diet for kidney disease less stressful and overwhelming. I often feel in clinic when discussing diet modifications for CKD that I'm giving driving instructions to someone who does not know how to drive. We decided to use the food skills questionnaire, which is a validated research tool created by the University of Western Ontario. The study is a pre-post study design. The food skills questionnaire assesses food skills in three domains, food selection, food preparation, and food safety, and provides an overall FSQ score. Pre and post scores will be compared using a paired t-test. The intervention consists of three two-hour online Zoom cooking classes that are kid, kidney, and budget-friendly. 
Sessions will include education around making appropriate food selection and modifications for the CKD diet, as well as basic cooking skills and food safety. We hope that the cooking sessions will have a meaningful impact on food skills. If the online cooking sessions are determined to be an effective method of delivery, we can expand to include more cooking sessions, create a library of videos, including holiday specials, expand to other areas of patient care, including dialysis and multi-organ transplant, as well as new home blenderized tube feed starts. Being in a frontline position, there is no time or capacity for research. You have to take the initiative on your own to find ways to make it successful. Support of your division is essential. I was fortunate to connect with UBC's Masters of Nutrition and Dietetic program and have been able to work with two amazing master students. Obtaining clinical instructor affiliation with UBC allowed me to have access to journal articles, statistical programs, as well as RISE. The Division of Nephrology offered biostatistician support. Time and funding are the two main challenges in doing frontline research as nothing is available for frontline staff. You end up doing research off the side of your desk and on your own time. For funding, you need to be resourceful, relying on divisional funds, or in my case, the generosity of the UBC Masters of Nutrition and Dietetic program. The benefits of doing research for me are greater job satisfaction, finding meaningful solutions to patient care issues, quality improvement, and great personal joy in having a real impact on patient care. In summary, I feel that practice-based research is essential and there needs to be better support for the frontline worker to engage in meaningful practice-based research to advance and enhance patient care. Hey everyone, my name is Shakira and I'm the mental health mentor nurse currently supporting the medical inpatient units at BC Children's Hospital. The project I wanted to share with all of you today is our Code White series project. In short, this project aims to deliver education about Code Whites through simulations with a massive focus on prevention. We want to increase physicians and nurses comfortability and skill level related to this topic. This project came about after a survey on mental health care that showed T7 nurses felt the least comfortable managing topics related to code whites. This survey also showed that de-escalation skills were the most requested education topic. Prevention and de-escalation is also identified as essential in a number of provincial guidelines. Issue is, we currently have minimal education about this on T7 and I really wanted to change this. I worked with mental health educators, T7 educators, psychiatric liaison nurse, residents, and physicians to help shape this project. We identified six subjects that cover commonly encountered situations. The topics that were chosen were based off of PSLS incident reports, needs identified by the quality and improvement project on T7, as well as things I see on the floor every single week. In terms of delivery, We adjusted the simulation intensity to a level that promotes learning and decreases stress. We have to remember, unlike mock code blues that we have all been practicing since medical school and nursing school, mock code whites are new, making this adjustment super important. In addition, we spend a little bit more time pre-briefing than you would normally see in a simulation. A huge focus in these simulations is also to explicitly go over the trauma-informed considerations and practices that should be applied to each of these scenarios. When dealing with soft skills, it's important to really distinguish between the nice-to-do practices and the essential-to-do practices. With this project, we're not only hoping to increase comfortability and knowledge, but we are also wanting to foster trust, empathy, and relationship building between our professions. We have currently piloted two of these topics. The feedback has been overwhelmingly positive. Next steps include piloting more of these simulations and having more physician involvement. We are hoping to be awarded one of the PRB research grants so we're able to recruit members who come from a research background because I know having outcome metrics is super essential. I'm a nurse and I have a dream, but I want to do this right because this topic is so, so important. We owe it to the families, children, and the youth that we care for to continue to strive to do better. Thank you so much for listening.
Hello, welcome to a brief presentation of the BC Children's Social Pediatrics PBR proposal titled Equity in Recruiting and Hiring in Social Pediatrics to Improve Teen Diversity and Patient Outcomes. My name is Denise Hansen, and I am of Afro-Caribbean heritage and humbly acknowledge the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. I align myself with the Truth and Reconciliation Actions and the Coast Salish teachings gifted to PHSA by Knowledge Keeper Shane Point. The richer social pediatrics team of pediatricians and nurse practitioners serve equity deserving and racially ethnic diverse communities in Vancouver's inner city. With the majority of Indigenous urban child and youth and their families who have historically experienced racialized barriers to quality health care services. Despite well-intentioned commitment to cultural humility and safety, allyship and action towards truth and reconciliation and trauma-informed practices, we recognize that the optics of the social pediatrics program lacks representation of indigeneity and racialized practitioners who have lived experiences and realities as racialized minorities and indigenous individuals navigating in colonialized spaces, systems, and structures rooted in dehumanizing practices that have caused generations of oppression and harm. There is emerging and compelling research supporting that racially minoritized patients who share the same race and ethnicity with their provider have improved communication, trusted relationships, better perceptions of care, and better health outcomes. Our proposal seeks to explore racial concordance perception within the community of social pediatric program to better inform policies on preferential recruitment and hiring of Indigenous and or racialized minority practitioners and allied professionals to improve our team diversity and patient outcomes. This work will also involve guidance from and consultation with the PHSA, EDI, and Indigenous health teams to ensure that our vision is in alignment with the six Coast Salish teachings that are represented and highlighted in our poster. Thank you for listening and not some up. We are one. My name is Bill McMillan. I'm uh, the Provincial Clinical Coordinator for the CDBC program, Complex Developmental Behavioral Conditions. My project is entitled Equity Hack, Promoting Child Developmental Healthcare in Remote Rural and Underserved Urban Communities. CDBC delivers multidisciplinary developmental assessments to children with significant developmental uh, needs across multiple domains. We deliver those assessments to the five regional health authorities. CDBC at Sunnyhill provides clinical administrative oversight. And we also deliver the, the most complex tier four plus services to the province. We need an equity hack because over the years, we've become over-reliant on community pediatrician referrals. Communities with limited pediatric provision are therefore disadvantaged. The family perception of wait time includes that uh, wait for the community pediatrician, which can be up to 18 months in some areas. GPs can't fill the gap. The referrals from communities with the most need are often of the lowest quality, making individual needs harder to discern. And these geographic and similar barriers are effectively structurally racist, and they lead inevitably to pervasive access inequity. You can see from this top graphic here that uh, the median age of referral for CDBC and BCAM children is significantly higher, older for remote rural children. The median um, age is one year, nine months older than their urban peers. On the lower graphic, we can see that proportionally speaking, Remote rural children are less likely to be referred before their sixth birthday. The family experience of this is similar. At the school, they talk of years lost to children on the wait list. Um, they talk of uh, potentially behavioral issues being flagged in that time, uh, reduced access to school, missing socialization, lots of implications there. The families talk of shame when they have to discuss private issues with people that they don't know. And there is a tendency that we hear within healthcare for the children of indigenous families to be diagnosed with conditions like fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, while their, their non-indigenous peers are diagnosed with ADHD or autism. 
this is a, a, a significant problem that has to be dealt with. And the problem starts at referral, and that's where we're going to try to start to tackle it. The aims of my project are one, to simplify and improve access to tertiary level developmental health care for remote rural communities and underserved urban communities. And secondly, to enable and empower primary care providers in remote rural and underserved urban communities. How are we going to do that? Well, I propose that we use what we have, and we have community RNs. Remote public health and other community RNs are available in greater numbers, and there are provincial plans to expand more training. Remote RNs living in remote nursing stations live in the community. They have high acuity backgrounds, they have an enhanced scope of practice, and the, the community is already accessing them for their other family health needs. They're known to the community. Similarly, public health RNs that already lead early years clinics, they have passive access to families via things like immunization clinics. They have lots of opportunity to discuss other health needs. They're the first point of contact for many families to talk about child health needs. They're known to the families. For both groups, there are definitely support needs. We need to think about for remote RNs in particular, they come with an adult background. They may well lack the education and the confidence of experience to provide child developmental health care. They do provide pediatric care, but predominantly it's public health, primary health, and emergency pediatric care. Their, their child, development, child development provision is limited, and they're already busy. Similarly, public health nurses are already busy. Uh, they do come with a, a strong child developmental child development background, but they are not used to making the referrals, so that's going to be a change in practice for them potentially. I propose that we create a, an application with four primary functions. First of all, demographics management. Secondly, and most importantly, to create a versatile and adaptive guided history taking application that will support a community RN to obtain a detailed and relevant history, even when they lack the background to do that, that uh, interview themselves. It will also support the community RN with gathering additional information, for example, birth records, and it will collate that information and support the submission to CDBC to BCAN, to a child development center, to a community pediatrician, could be anyone. Um, and we, we, we believe that this is, uh, while this will start, so we're going to have to do a lot of research and we're going to have to build this application. But we believe that within eight to 12 months, we'll be uh, effectively rolling it out across the province. We'll then start analysis to look at um, whether the outcomes of the assessments that we complete match the, the incoming information, make sure that the application is doing its job. And then we'll potentially look to expand to other ambulatory clinics within BC Children's, if it's wanted, or even potentially to other um, other provinces doing similar work. And that's the end. Any questions? Hi, my name is Kendall. I'm a social worker at the BC Children's Hospital Gender Clinic. We see youth from all over the province, and you can see in our neat little graph in the center that our referral volume has doubled in the last couple of years since the beginning of COVID. Um, with all of these young people that we're seeing in our clinical experience, we're noticing a few things that are a gap in service for our youth that we're hoping to address through a short-term counseling project. One of these things is that um, research shows that enthusiastically supportive family members can, are a huge protective factor for our gender diverse youth and youth with enthusiastically supportive family members have no greater rates of depression than their cisgendered peers and that family connectedness is a significant protective factor for youth with regards to self-harm and suicide. We're finding these caregivers have only just found out sometimes about gender diversity and there's not really a space for them to go and process these feelings and get to a place where they can be enthusiastically supportive if they don't have the means to pay for that service privately. We are also noticing that there's a gap of funded mental health support for gender diverse youth from safe and knowledgeable practitioners that can really affirm this exploration is a normal part of growing up and can really help them figure out who they are and how to shine. And then lastly, we're finding that the hormone readiness assessments, which everybody needs in order to access gender affirming medical care, are taking longer because their families are trying to get those needs met through the assessment. So we're hoping that if we can create a program for families to get these needs met, 
prior to the assessment, that the assessment will go more quickly and we can offer assessment to more youth and families and really support everybody in a more equitable and timely manner. We are really hoping to turn gender dysphoria into gender joy and we're hoping that by creating this short-term counseling project and researching it along the way we can prove that this really does help decrease wait times and alleviate distress for our families and with the data to show it we can justify funding and continue to grow this program so that we can best support our gender diverse youth. Thank you so much for listening. Hi everyone, my name is Parker Mills. I'm one of the critical care outreach nurses here at BC Children's Hospital. Uh, firstly, thank you very much for giving our team the opportunity to present our practice-based research project idea with you all. Um, really excited to be sharing this with you. And the title of this project is called Expanding Critical Care Services Beyond the PICU Walls, Implementation of a Nurse-Led Critical Care Outreach Service. And the focus of our project really is gonna be more towards our CECOM provincial outreach support work that we've been doing. Um, for clinical experience, the CECOM program currently supports four PICU-RNs, myself, Jason, Tanisa, and Anna. Our coverage is 12 hours, um, seven days a week. And really, we're a resource to provide support through a critical care lens to areas outside of critical care. And that's both within, within BC Children's Hospital and throughout the province. In response to the respiratory surge that we saw over the last year, the CECOM program did see an increase in provincial outreach support calls. And we've recently been approved to hire four additional CECOM team members to increase our coverage to 16 hours a day, which is really exciting and should be kind of going live over the next two weeks. Uh, for background, the CECON team really just wants to gain a better understanding of how we can improve our support to nursing and providers caring for sick children outside of BC Children's Hospital. These patients may be held in their home communities awaiting transport due to a number of factors, and that includes increased pediatric patient volumes, limited transport abilities, weather, et cetera. And the vision of this project is really to just better support the critically ill child and their family while they're in the home community and the point of care clinicians who are caring for them for maybe a prolonged period of time or longer than they expected. And again, the focus is going to be more on the CECOM provincial outreach support. The objectives really is to improve our integration and workflow with the BC Children's PICU Transport Advisor, which is a 24 seven role. We want to we want CECON support to be offered during PTN calls more routinely and standardly, and we want to be able to provide immediate and ongoing advice, support, and guidance to teams in the community from a nursing perspective. We want to participate in more of a provincial team rounding um, format, which is something that Child Health BC has been envisioning. Um, and then we're really hoping to just receive support with the evaluation and implementation of this project uh, through the PBR Research Challenge and through NKI. Um, below you see, that, you see that I included a couple graphics. Um, I just want to highlight the provincial external support call graph, um, which you can see from October 2022 to about March 2023. Um, we did have a pretty significant increase in the um, provincial outreach um, calls that we were receiving. Um, so that means that hospitals uh, or um, providers from outside centers were calling us to get advice or um, guidance on medication infusions, pedi accessing pediatric policies, um, helping them with their assessment of a pediatric patient, um, et cetera. Um, over from January 2022 to September 2023, we had a total number of calls of 1,513, and 110 of those were provincial external support calls. I've also included some patient and family um, feedback quotes uh, from our surveys. And I've also included uh, provincial outreach feedback um, that we received from our surveys as well. For next steps, we really want to orientate our four new CECON members, expand our coverage to 16 hours a day, work on developing um, that working relationship with the PICU transport advisor, integrating our CECON support call into PTN calls and really being proactive as a group in the support that we're providing and offering and developing data collection strategies. So really thinking critically about how are we gonna document these calls? What type of data are we looking to collect? How are we doing it? And of course, we wanna receive feedback from outside centers and review that data and feedback so that we can continuously improve as a group and improve the support that we're providing um, and the care we're providing to pediatric patients and their families throughout this province. 
Um, there's also some QR codes there. One will take you to a CECON algorithm and one will take you to um, the provincial outreach poster that we've been providing to external sites um, to put up in their units so that it's a reminder that we're available. Um, that was a very brief presentation of our research idea, but thank you very much for listening. Um, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to reach out to our CECON inbox and that is at bcch underscore ccon at cw.bc.ca. Thank you. Bye. Hi, my name is Pauline Shapton, and today I'm going to present to you a poster on a quality improvement project on nurse-led journal clubs. This project will be expanding on a current journal club that is being run by our professional practice group in oncology. This journal club is focusing on the effects of this journal club, uh, improving knowledge translation and job satisfaction. The current hypothesis, therefore, is can a nurse-led journal club improve nurses' knowledge translation, translation sorry, and or job satisfaction? The reason why we're focusing on these two aspects is because journal clubs have been shown to be a useful tool in knowledge translation, thus reducing the research to practice gap and helping us in our practice to critically appraise. I would like to theorize that if this tool can be used to help us to critically appraise in our clinical practice, that it could also potentially improve our confidence in our practice and thus our job satisfaction. And therefore our hypothesis question. Uh, currently with our journal club, we are identifying articles nurses would like to focus on. We're grabbing those articles using our uh, BC Children Librarian, then discussing those articles and then offering a survey to help us reflect on how the journal discussion has helped in um, their job satisfaction and knowledge translation. With the help of this research grant, I would like to follow the following timeline and expand on this, this project. I would like the help to, of refining our survey so that it really captures the key aspects of knowledge translation and job satisfaction, while also improving a analysis process that helps us answer our hypothesis question, and then finally writing a quality improvement project. If this project was successful, I would love to share it with further nursing disciplinaries um, and organizations. Thank you for your time. Hi, my name is Gabrielle. I'm an occupational therapist in the BC Women's NICU. Uh, my project, our project is called Early Feeding in the NICU, where does the evidence guide a pilot project? Um, I was recently at a conference in Arizona and um, some of the neonatal nurses and neonatal therapists there were talking about uh, a, an intervention that they're doing with their babies where they provide um, milk drops of express breast milk to babies of very early gestational ages. Um, and that's not completely foreign to our NICU. We already provide oral immune therapy with express breast milk, uh, but the manner in which they were doing it was quite novel and addressing a lot of the um, principle of uh, feeding, which was they were really uh, reading the baby's cues to help guide their intervention. Um, and they believe that that helps mitigate some of the trauma that can be uh, experienced by babies around ha always having experiences happen to them around their mouth and around feeding. Um, so we're really interested to review uh, the evidence behind that approach. There's been an article uh, published this year um, with uh, a big uh, bibliography to it as well. Um, after our literature review, we would like to uh, develop a pilot project for our NICU uh, to see if we can do this intervention um, safely in our NICU, should it be found to be a valid one to do. Uh, thank you for listening. That's very short and sweet for me, but we're excited about this.
Hello, Children's and Women's Hospital Practice-Based Research Conference attendees. My name is Kirsten. I work as a lactation consultant at BC Women's. In my role as a lactation specialist, I have dedicated long hours of clinical practice to supporting families at the bedside with low milk supply and struggling to feed their babies. One of the first interventions that we often provide or suggest is skin-to-skin -skin contact. What is skin-to-skin -skin contact? Well, skin-to-skin -skin contact is when a mother-parent caregiver holds their naked infant against their bare chest, ideally as soon as possible after birth and for prolonged periods of the time in the postpartum period. Skin-to-skin -skin contact is recommended by the World Health Organization and the Canadian Pediatric Society as an essential practice to support infants in transitioning to the extrauterine environment, establish parent-infant relationships, and support early feeding. Skin-to-skin -skin contact is evidence-based, citing short and long-term outcomes such as improved physiological regulation, reduced crying, reduced pain and stress during painful procedures, and improved breastfeeding. A noted facilitator of skin-to-skin -skin contact for both premature and term infants are wraps. What are wraps? Well, they're pieces of material that either wrap or fasten around the parent caregiver, which helps hold their infant in a safe, upright, chest-to-chest -chest position. Research studies in a variety of income settings and countries have noted the benefits of providing families a wrap to support skin-to-skin -skin contact between mother-parent caregiver and their infant. Wraps have been shown to provide increased comfort for families, feelings of security, and being closer with their infant. As well, wraps reduce the risk of falls during skin-to-skin -skin contact and support a parent to relax, to rest, and to bond with their infant. Keeping parents and newborns together is essential. Skin-to-skin -skin contact that is early and prolonged enables parents to take a central role in their own and their newborn's care. When families are actively supported to participate in skin-to-skin -skin contact, we will see improved parent-infant attachment increase parent confidence, support for maternal mental health postpartum, improve breastfeeding, and better understanding of infant behaviors and cues. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ria Nishikawara, and I'm recording on behalf of my colleague, Rebecca Weaver, who has lost her voice today. Rebecca is a registered physiotherapist at the BC Women's Hospital Center for Pelvic Pain and Endometriosis. This is the poster presentation for her practice-based research project proposal, Virtual Physiotherapy Care. Is it acceptable and effective for patients with chronic pelvic pain? Since the COVID-19 pandemic, our center has begun offering virtual physiotherapy appointments in combination with in-person visits. There has been good feedback from patients about their virtual care experience, but we have yet to formally evaluate it from the patient's perspective. It's important to understand virtual care from the patient's perspective to ensure that we're optimizing patient care and delivering it in a way that is patient-centered, equitable, and culturally safe. There have been several studies that measure and evaluate virtual care from the healthcare provider's point of view, but very few studies have explored the patient's perspective of virtual care. In the studies that have looked at the patient perspective, patients have reported high levels of satisfaction with virtual physiotherapy care in the musculoskeletal and rheumatology settings, but little is known about the experience of virtual physiotherapy care for people with chronic pelvic pain. It is important to understand this more deeply and to assess when virtual care is or is not appropriate, what the most helpful aspects of virtual care may be, and what changes or adaptations would make it even more beneficial. The aim of our study is to better understand patient perspectives on virtual physiotherapy care, including what aspects of virtual care are the most helpful, what are the areas that could be improved, is virtual care acceptable and effective for patients with chronic pelvic pain. 
These answers will provide the information we need to optimize virtual physiotherapy care and, in turn, improve physiotherapy outcomes for people with chronic pelvic pain. This will be an evaluative study. This methodology will utilize anonymous surveys that are distributed to patients following their virtual physiotherapy visits. We will gather quantitative and qualitative feedback regarding their satisfaction and overall experience. Quantitative data will be gathered using Likert scales, then analyzed using statistical means. And qualitative data will be gathered using open-ended questions and analyzed using a qualitative descriptive approach to identify emerging themes. The next steps for this project include securing funding, developing our questionnaire and open-ended questions, gaining ethics approval, recruiting patients, collecting and analyzing data, and disseminating our findings. Rebecca would like to acknowledge the help of our team members at the Center for Pelvic Pain and Endometriosis, as well as future patient participants that make this project possible. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, my name is Emily Rigglesworth and I'm a child life specialist here at BC Children's Hospital. For those of you who aren't familiar with child life, we are educated and clinically trained in the developmental impact of illness and injury. Child life specialists help infants, children, youth, and their family cope with the stress, trauma, and uncertainty of acute and chronic illness, trauma, disability, loss, and bereavement. So our goal is to reduce the negative impact of these stressful and traumatic life events. And we do this through different evidence-based and developmentally appropriate interventions. Some of these are therapeutic play, preparation and procedural sports, supports, pardon me, non-pharmacological pain management techniques and coping skills, diagnosis teaching, and bereavement support. So for myself, I currently work in the medical imaging department, but I've also had the privilege of working at Sunny Hill Health Center and various other inpatient units. So in clinical practice, myself and other child life specialists support many children, including those with developmental disabilities, and we help them through distressing healthcare experiences. Um, so research in this area is really important to help us further understand the psychosocial impact that medical encounters can have with this particularly vulnerable population. So there's a newly emerging uh, term called pediatric medical traumatic stress. And according to the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, this refers to a set of psychological and physiological responses of children and their families to pain, injury, serious illness, medical procedures, and evasive or frightening treatment experiences medical trauma may occur as a response to a single or multiple medical events. So I'm specifically interested in how this framework, pediatric medical traumatic stress, uh, affects children with developmental disabilities. So the literature um, currently indicates that this population is more likely to encounter healthcare in general and can uh, have increased challenges with coping with these healthcare experiences. So for my objective, um, so I'm hoping in my research to explore pediatric medical traumatic stress in children with developmental disabilities. So for the methods, I've chosen to do a scoping review, and that is because in my preliminary research, um, I have noted there isn't a ton of literature on this topic. Um, but I know scoping reviews are a great overview of the current literature and can help identify the gaps in knowledge that can help aid in future research. Um, if my results are too limited, so with my um, preliminary search, then I may need to adjust or widen um, the parameters of the study. So for the next steps, First, I will need to finish the preliminary search and then decide if I need to widen or adjust the parameters of the study. So change the research question a bit. And then from there, I would go on to a more formal search. So yeah, that is it for my presentation today. Thank you so much for listening. And I'd like to give a huge thank you to the practice-based research team, um, including Andrea Rice, who is the clinical librarian, um, just for all of their support, guidance, and expertise um, to help me start with this project. So thank you so much for listening. Bye.
Hello, everybody. My name is Heather Yassel, and I am the clinical nurse educator in the Gynecological Surgical Services at BC Women's Hospital. It seems fitting that I'm the last person because it's the very end of the day, and I don't have much of a voice left, so bear with me. Um, so my practice-based research challenge is aligned to help me to build my evidence-based values clarification process. So I just finished my master's at the University of Saskatchewan. And for my capstone project, I completed a values uh, scoping. It was a scoping review of um, values clarification processes used by different healthcare professionals. And what I found out is that there's not very much evidence out there on using values clarification to assist healthcare professionals in um, navigating ethically challenging situations. So for my clinical experience, I wanted to highlight that governing bodies of healthcare professionals across Canada include standards and competencies for entry to practice that involve ethical concepts such as respecting patient wishes and advocating for patient choice. Different specialized areas of care, such as termination of pregnancy, medically assisted dying, palliative care, oncology, critical care, have all known to pose ethical dilemmas for members of the healthcare teams. Delivering patient care that is at odds with personal and cultural beliefs may result in ethical turmoil, which can lead to moral distress. A process called values clarification has the capacity to aid healthcare professionals in navigating morally, morally challenging situations that conflict with their own values. Values clarification, values clarification processes have the potential to assist healthcare professionals to better understand and appreciate their own values and enable them to provide more compassionate care without ethical conflict. Values Clarification empowers healthcare professionals to gain a clear understanding of their own personal values. It enables them to authentically be present in providing care in morally challenging situations and will strengthen them to provide care over longer periods of time. So the background is the gap that I noticed in the evidence regarding values clarification processes used by healthcare professionals. Why is this work important? There's ample evidence on moral distress and its negative impact on healthcare professionals. We need to protect and support the mental health of healthcare professionals, which will in turn create more equitable care for patients regardless of their choice. We can do this through an evidence-based values clarification process tailored for healthcare professionals. What is already known? The outcomes of values clarification has been studied extensively on patient use when choosing healthcare options. In a scoping review that I completed, I identified that values clarification has been studied within a variety of different, different disciplines and specialties. The majority of tools have been utilized within one specific discipline and in only incorporated three, two to three different methods. I identified nine different methods, which you can see in the chart included. 57% of the literature was not research-based and only two used validated tools for pre and post tests to quantify and compare results. So what remains unknown? There's an evident gap, gap in the existence of a process that incorporates different methods developed through research and evidence based processes that can be utilized by healthcare professionals across different specialties. So my aim is to bring awareness about the topic of values clarification and the future opportunity to incorporate values clarification in your departments. I would like to identify the presence of validated tools for measuring moral distress and utilize those tools to create a pre and post test. I would then build a values clarification process utilizing four to five different methods. So step-by-step, step, I wanna find some tools. I wanna to build the process. I wanna implement the process. I wanna reevaluate it and I wanna improve it. So my next steps are to submit my scoping review for publication in the new year. 
I'm going to find some tools to measure moral distress across specialties. And if there isn't one, try to build one. Um, and I do want to send a big, big thank you to Dr. Brian Fitzsimmons and Dr. Pamela Petruca, who was my professor at U of S, for their guidance and support in this endeavor. And also a huge thank you to Miranda, Jennifer, and Nicole, and everybody over at the <clears throat> Knowledge Translation Department and um, the Women's Health Research Institute. Thank you.